the risen king seated in majesty so we bless God today are you ready for a word today I said are you ready for a word from the Lord today turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 17 we're going to read our text and then we're going to pray and then we'll go into the word of God if you don't mind resting on your feet as we read from 1 Samuel 17 we'll start looking at verses 17 and 18 reads thusly, and Jesse said to David, his son, take now for thy brothering an ephah of this parched corn and these ten loaves and run to the camp of thy brethren. Verse 18. And carried these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousands and look how thy brethren fare and take their pledge Verse 23, and as he talked with them, behold, there came up a champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistine. He spoke according to the, he spoke according to the same words, and David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. The men of Israel said, have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel he has come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the men that stood by, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, so shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And Eliab, his elder brother, heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David and said, Why comest thou down hither? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and thy naughtiness in thy heart. Thou art come down that thou as may see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? Is there, is there not a cause? And he turned, and he turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. And when the words were heard, which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight this Philistine. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hands, and I will smite thee, and I will take thine head from off thee. And I will give thy caucus to the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the, and to the wild beast of the earth that all the earth may know that there, there is a God in Israel. And all the assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not by sword and spear for the battle is the Lord. And he will give you into our hands. Here's my subject, and then we're going to pray. The subject is prepared for battle. Prepared for battle. 
If you don't mind, just contact somebody, hold a hand. Or... Father, we thank you now for the blessing that's already attached to your word. For we're about to hear a word that will change the course of our lives. And get us on track to being and becoming what you called us to be. We thank you that every time we hear your word, we are changed. We thank you for the change that's about to happen. We are ready to hear what thus saith the Lord. Speak now. We ask it in Jesus' name. Everybody say amen. You may be seated. Prepare for battle coach was asked after his superior team lost the game to a lesser opponent but they were expected to win the coach was asked how did your team lose to a team you were su- supposed to crush the coach replied we lost the game before we ever step foot on the field. He says, we lost the game in the locker room. He said, if you look back on what, what really happened, it wasn't that we were faced with a better opponent. It wasn't that our opponent had a better game plan. And it, and it wasn't that they had home field advantage. He said, looking back, he says, our boys lost the game before they ever came out of the locker room. He said, because they didn't come out ready. He said, they spent the night before out partying and doing whatever they wanted to do and, 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 and hurting their body, and they, they, they just weren't, weren't ready for the game. And that's why we lost. Well, brothers and sisters, the same is true in life and in ministry. Because the truth is, fights are won before the battle even begins. Somebody say amen. How one comes out of battle is determined, really, before you even go into battle. The success of a struggle is determined before the struggle even began. The result of a test that you take, whether in school or otherwise, is already determined before you mark your answer to the first question. Because you don't study for a test while taking the test. You have to already have passed before you write the first answer down. Lord have mercy. So how you prepare beforehand makes a difference as to whether you will be whether you will come out reaping or weeping. What you bring to the battlefield determines what will happen on the battlefield. How you go in will determine how you come out. What you bring to it will determine how you get through it. No other story is, is, gives us a, a clearer exegetical explanation as to what I just said than the story of David and Goliath. The Philistines were gathered once again to make war against the armies of Israel. They arrayed themselves on opposite sides of the valley. You have on one side of the valley the Philistine army and you have on the other side of the valley the armies of Israel and rather than engage in a typical or traditional warfare the Philistines have sent out their champion Goliath sent him out into the to the valley he's he's a big boy he's big bad and battle ready and this testimony is I'm undefeated. I've defeated thousands upon thousands single-handedly. 
The Bible says that, that he comes down to the valley every day for 40 days and looks across the street at the armies of Israel and challenging, challenges them and t- says to them, y'all send me one man over here and we're going to fight each other. One, one man. And he says, he says, if he beats me, then we'll be your slave. He says, but when I whip him, y'all going to be our slaves. Notice that the enemy of God comes down into the valley where Israel is. The enemy is not afraid to show up where you are. In fact, he's not afraid to show up in church. Somebody say amen to that. He shows up in the presence of God's people and he begins to taunt them. He says, I thought y'all said that your God is a way maker. He said, I thought y'all said that he's a heart fixer. He said, I, and I, didn't I hear y'all say last week that he was a mind regulator? He said, I heard y'all say that. I heard all of you say that. I thought you just sang the song, This House Shall Be Called. A house where broken people are, are put back together. Didn't I just hear y'all? That's what Goliath is saying. Didn't I just hear all y'all say that? Just heard all y'all say that. Well, look at you now with your pole looking self. That's Goliath. He's taunting them, y'all. Look at you with your pole. And he did this for 40 days. Say, I dare you to send somebody who will stand up against me. They couldn't find nobody. Looked high and low. Still couldn't find nobody to stand up against this giant of trouble. Nobody to face this adversary. Nobody to stand up and say, I do believe that our God is an awesome God. Nobody. It's a sad day when the enemy is found yapping and running his mouth in defiance to God and his people and nobody has anything to say. We are too busy trying to accumulate votes to become president of the chicken frying committee rather than engage and notice that we have an enemy in our camp. Lord, I wish I had some help in here today. An enemy who's messing with our children and and messing with our homes and trying to destroy our relationships. But I pray that God stirs somebody's heart in here today that will not sit idly by and let the enemy run rampant in your life. And you'll stand up and declare that enough is enough. You know the story. Scholars are baffled as to how David was able to kill Goliath with just one smooth stone. But they didn't understand that David had more in his arsenal than five rocks in a slingshot. He found five stones in the valley, but it's not what David took from the valley to win the fight is what David took to the valley. It's not what David found in the valley that gave him the victory. It's what David brought into the valley with him that gave him the victory. It's not what you find in church that gives you the victory. It's what you bring to church. That gives you. It's not what you find in worship service that gives you deliverance. It's what you bring to the worship service. So David had an internal conversation that allowed him to take out this nine foot, six inch, 700 pound mammoth of a man. And this conversation provides insight that concealed the weapons that gave him victory in the battle in the valley. 
The one thing that David took him took with him was that David took with him a vision for victory. Somebody say vision for victory. Before you go into the fight, you've got to see yourself winning decisively. Before the first blow is thrown, you've got to see yourself winning decisively. See, see, the reason why you've got to go in a winner is because you can't depend on folk to help you win. Because there are all kinds of people who are going to show up in the valley. There are people who make things happen. There are people who watch things happen. And there are people who wonder what happened. David shows up. And the soldiers are talking about things that don't even matter. Lord have mercy. They're talking about how big Goliath is. They're talking about how he's killed more than thousands of other men. They're, they're talking about the size of his weapons. They are impressed with what the enemy can do. Lord, help me right here. I say they are impressed by what the enemy is saying he can do instead of being impressed with what God is saying he's going to do. Lord, help me out. So David shows up and they're talking about nothing. They were talking about how they're going to become slaves to the enemy. And when David shows up, all David wants to know is what's going to happen to the man who takes Goliath down? In other words, David is saying, when I take him down, what am I going to get? <laughs> so David walked in with a vision for victory. Notice he's the last one to show up on the scene, but he's the first one to talk about God. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine when everybody else saw the size of the giant, David saw the size of his God. David saw that this battle with Goliath was not something he was going to, it was something he was going through. There's a difference. Because when your attitude is that it is something you're going to, means that you're planning to stay there. But if your attitude when you go in is that I'm going through, you're already planning, I'm getting out. Tell somebody I'm coming out. I'm coming out. When, you, when your attitude is, this is something I'm going through, you are saying it ain't going to always be this way. Lord, help me now. Whenever a problem shows up in the life of a believer, God always has a plan. So whenever you're dealing with God, know this, God does not even get started until he finishes. God doesn't even start until he finishes. The Bible says that God establishes the end before the beginning. In other words, before God puts you at start, he always already works out your outcome. God, help me in here today. He already works out. Th that means, get this you now, that means that if God starts with the end before he starts with the beginning, that means God gives the answer before the question is even asked. <laughs> but the problem is, we don't always recognize the answer. And we don't know it is the answer because the question hadn't even been asked yet. So our problem is accentuated because we have an answer we don't even recognize. So God looked ahead and God saw a situation was going to come 
So God sends Moses ahead of time. Send Moses and tell Moses, you're my answer to a question the people of Israel is not, are not even asking anymore. Because they have been indoctrinated in the Egyptian slavery so long, they don't even know that they can get out of it. They don't even know that I got an answer to their situation. Y'all ain't going to help me now. They don't even realize they've been in it so long they don't know that, that freedom is a possibility. But Moses, before I unveil you to the world, because they ain't ready for you yet, I got to hide you first. Because you are the answer to a question nobody's asking. God's hiding you is his way of, of protecting you from premature self-destruction. Because you are an answer to somebody's question that they're not even asking. So God is saying, if I release the answer too soon, they're going to kill you. So I got to hold you back so they'll recognize you for who you are and they won't misdiagnose who you are because they don't know the question yet. Are y'all with me right now? The reason why I'm going to hold you back, Moses, is because they are not ready for you yet. And you are not ready for them yet. I'm going to hold you back until they get ready for you. And I'm going to hold you back until you get ready for them. Because if I give you to them too soon, they're going to either kill you or you're going to go in and try to fix it with your own hand and mess everything up. Y'all ain't hear me. Because your necessity is only valuable when there's a question you are the answer to. You're only going to find your niche in life when you discover what question you answer. When the question is not being asked, it is because it's not your time. When the enemy wants to unnerve you, he will always give you a commercial of somebody else who is going through the same thing you're going through to try to get you to not be the answer God called you to be. He wants you to watch somebody else succumb to what you're in right now and once he shows you somebody going through the exact same thing you're going through and they fall down, he's going to then tell you you're next. So at a funeral, he'll, he'll show up and whisper in your ear and tell you the same way I took out your mama. I'm going to do the same thing to you. He'll show up and he'll, he'll tell you the, the same way, the same way I got your daddy hooked on alcohol, I'm going to get you hooked on alcohol. Because you watch somebody else try and fail, why in the world are you going to try when you never saw anybody else get it right? He's trying to stop you from being the answer you are so that you won't show up when the question is asked. Elijah shook up a nation as a powerful man of God. Elijah killed 450 prophets of Baal. But one woman said to Elijah, before the sun goes down tomorrow, I'm going to have your head. He just killed 450 prophets of Baal. One woman threatens him. And Elijah runs for his life. Isn't it something? How you can be powerful over here. And a cream puff over here. Isn't, isn't it something how you can, you can be 
strong on one side of your life and weak in another area of your life. But the dichotomous reality of every one of us in here is that we are one way on one stage and we are another way on another stage. You can be an awesome mother, but a terrible wife. Ain't nobody said amen to that. You can be an awesome man who puts a roof over the head of your family, but, but you're never present in the house, even when you're there. Moses felt the call of God on his life. He heard God speak through a burning bush. Moses, Moses knew that God had an anointing on his life. And Moses went out because he felt this call. Moses got ahead of God and went out and tried to take over the Egyptians with his bare hands. He killed a man. I guess he thought he was going to kill millions of them with his bare hands. But God said, Moses, you're moving out too fast. You got to wait to the time I tell you to step forth because you're trying to answer something they're not even asking yet. Sometimes the reason things are not working right in your life is not because God didn't say it. It's because you jumped too early. And any time you come out of something before you have outgrown it, you are born prematurely. Anytime a baby is born before he has finished developing, he's going to have to sit somewhere else before he can go face his life because he came out too soon. Y'all ain't going to help me. And see, they got to they gotta put him in a place because his body has not developed enough where he can fight off all these diseases that are trying to take him over. God says there's stuff out there that's trying to kill you. And if I let you go too soon because your faith is not strong enough to fight it off, I've got to hide you for a while until the question has been asked. Second thing David took with him to the battle was David took with him into this battle an ability to reject discouragement. David took with him the ability to reject discouragement. Jesus, David shows up at the battlefield where all the soldiers were afraid to fight. Remember, nobody is trying to fight Goliath. Nobody's trying to take him on. And his, his brother Eliab meets David and says to David, what are you doing here? Shouldn't you be tending to those few sheep that you have to tend to every day? What are you doing here? I like David's response because David shows us that this boy is getting on his nerves. David ref- responds in verse 29. David says, what have I done now? Eli, what have I done this time? In, in other words, Eli, Eli, you've always been after me. You, you've always had a problem with me. You've always tried to take me down. What have I done this time, Eli? Where did I go wrong in your eyes this time? See, the reason why some folk got a problem with you is because they are envious of you. Don't let folk who are envious of you advise you. Never underestimate How far jealous people will go to contend with you when they know God's favor is on your life. See, everybody in your corner ain't got your back. Everybody smiling in your face ain't your friend. Everybody that's walking in your direction ain't walking with you. Let me encourage you with this. Everybody doesn't have to like you. Just the right person needs to like you. Let me say that again. Everybody don't have to like you. Just the right person needs to like you. Hashtag God knows who matters. 
Because if you leave my life, you didn't matter. Hashtag let them go. Hashtag let God work it. Hashtag go sit down. Because if you let your flesh get in the way, it's going to mess everything up. Hashtag, you don't need favor from everybody, just favor from the right body. Remember, Jesus said, I'm sending you among wolves. The sad reality is that not only are we among wolves, there are wolves in sheep's clothing. There are wolves that look like sheep. Lord, have mercy. Verse 28 says, did I give you verse 28? Let's look at this, y'all. Look at this. Verse 28 says, And Eliab, the eldest brother, heard when David spake unto the men. And Eliab was anger. Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why cometh thou down hither? And whom have you left with those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and thy naughtiness in thy heart. Thou, for thou have come down here that thou mayest see the battle. You've come down here, David, to see the battle. Wait a minute. What battle? Did we miss something? Y'all ain't fighting. What battle are you talking about? I'm coming to see. All I see is a bunch of so-called saints sitting on their hands. What battle? What battle are you fighting? Or are you just singing a song to get through your day? What 